Hello, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Thank you ever so much for joining us uh, for this webinar on a really critical issue for energy transitions. It's about mobilizing investors, particularly institutional investors, uh, to finance clean energy transitions. Um, this webinar is taking place um, under the aegis of the Investment and Finance Initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial. Uh, and I'm delighted that we've been joined to start off uh, with two countries that have really taken the lead in this initiative, um, that's Denmark and Germany. Um, and I'll be going across very shortly for some opening remarks uh, from representatives of, of both of those countries. Um, just to say that uh, we're delighted to see how many of you have joined us. Um, we hope to make this an interactive session. Um, so you'll see in the browser, you have the opportunity to ask questions and make comments. Uh, please don't hesitate to take advantage of that possibility, uh, and we'll do our best to get to all of these questions as we go through. Uh, my name is Tim Gould. I'm from the International Energy Agency, um, and I am the head of division for energy supply uh, outlooks and investment. And what I'd like to do now is to pass across the floor to um, Hannah Jeslit from uh, the Ministry uh, of Climate, Energy and Utilities of Denmark uh, to say a few words of introduction. Hannah, over to you. Thank you. Yes, on behalf of Denmark, I'm very pleased to welcome you also to this webinar. Uh, unlocking of uh, private capital is really key to accelerating investments in the clean energy transition and in, in achieving the Paris Agreement goals. In addition, private investors alongside governments will have a pivotal role to play in making the post-COVID economic recovery a green and sustainable one. Uh, in Denmark, we will use our new climate action plan as a tool to ramp up the deployment of clean energy solutions and achieve our 70% emissions reduction target by 2030. But we cannot make this happen without the financial support of institutional investors. We believe that collaboration and interaction between the public and private sector uh, is imperative to accelerate clean energy investments. This is the conversation we have. We hope to have with governments and investors in the context of the Clean Energy Ministerial Investment and Finance. And this is also what Denmark is aiming for through another initiative, the Climate Investment Coalition, where we collabor collaborate with institutional investors on sharing best practices of enabling policy frameworks and financial models. At the webinar today, we hope uh, we look very much forward to hearing your perspectives on what is needed to mobilize investors to, to finance the clean energy transition, how to build back greener and create momentum for higher climate ambition. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Hannah. Um, I'd now like to go across oh. one who you won't be able to see um, on the screen, but it's, uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear. It's uh, Michael Hackenthal from the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy of Germany. Michael, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Hannah, and apologies for not being visible. I thought that by now I'd completed the full learning curve um, in video conferencing, but apparently there's still some way to go. Um, yes, um, thank you for today's event. Um, the um, current um, COVID-19 crisis um, of course, it's a very challenging time for us uh, and for clean energy investment. Um, it creates huge insecurity about the future, which is never um, so good for um, investment. At the same time, we see um, also big opportunities and big chance to now set the conditions right to, as Hannah said, uh, build back better and um, really um, succeed at a, at a green recovery. Um, the next couple of weeks and months uh, will be extremely decisive as um, countries around the world uh, decide on their stimulus packages, um, whether uh, and take uh, decisions uh, which will shape the investment um, landscape for years, um, at least, if not, uh, if not the next decade. Um, Germany, um, already decided on its stimulus package um, on 10th of June. It's now completing um, parliamentary procedures. 
Um, and uh, I'm happy that I think we have um, a very strong, uh, quite a very strong boost for clean energy in that stimulus package, um, especially in developing um, the hydrogen economy and in giving e-mobility a big push forward. Um, but of course, still a lot of the fine tuning, how the funding allocated can be best used to really leverage as much private investment as possible. Uh, also still has to be done to a large degree. Um, another um, sort of non-financial aspect I'd like to point out, in which actually the, this crisis situation also has a, its good side for um, clean energy investment, is that on a couple of regulatory issues in Germany that were pending and <laughs> which were all going back clean energy investment, um, we have made progress like, um, for example, clarifying um, the rules for um, onshore wind. But we're now optimistic that uh, the speed of um, uh, project implementation will really pick up again um, now. So um, I look forward a lot to the discussion today. Great that we have um, the finance industry on board to have a real dialogue between uh, the uh, well, private uh, investors and uh, people from uh, governments. So um, thanks a lot and uh, an interesting event to us all. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I think those introductory words from Hannah and from Michael have introduced um, some of the key themes for today. Um, difficult time for investors, difficult time for clean energy investments, um, importance of the stimulus packages, importance of leveraging those actions to uh, bring in as much private investment as possible, uh, uh, bringing in capital markets. Um, at the International Energy Agency, we do an annual review of the landscape for global energy investment. Um, we released that a few weeks ago, and uh, what I'd now like to do is to ask the head of our investment team, uh, Michael Waldron, uh, to talk us through some of the key findings from that analysis uh, that are particularly relevant for our discussion today. So, Michael, over to you. Thank you very much, Tim, and, uh, and thank you as well to, to Hannah and Michael for the, the opening remarks. Uh, everybody should now see the, the slide deck on their screen, so I, I hope this is the case. Um, so as, as Tim said, we're, we're tracking investments across the energy sector. Uh, in our World Energy Investment Report, we're doing this on an annual basis. Uh, this is now the fifth edition we've produced the World Energy Investment Report. And normally we would be looking uh, in the past. So we would be looking back a year at what happened in 2019. But because of the extraordinary events that we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, um, the investment report has really taken on a focus of, of this year's investment uh, trends and, and estimates. Um, so we're trying to incorporate the latest data that we've seen um, going through mid-May of this year. And with that, I will kick it off uh, with the main results uh, of the investment uh, that we track. Uh, so we're looking at capital expenditures across all energy sectors, energy supply, um, infrastructure, energy efficiency on the demand side. Um, at the beginning of the year, we were expecting about $1.9 trillion of capital expenditures to be made with an increase of 2%. Uh, an increase of 2% may not be so much, but considering that investment had gone down every year since 2014, uh, for us, this represented an interesting break in trend. Of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic, those expectations that we were uh, tracking from the different companies, governments, projects, etc., have turned into a decline of almost $400 billion of capital expenditure, um, or over 20% uh, by our estimates. And many of these investment cuts are concentrated in regions where the oil and gas industry plays uh, a very important role. So the United States is a big one, um, but also the Middle East, Russia, uh, and the Caspian region. But of course, investment cuts are also concentrated in a number of other regions in the world, and all different energy sectors are affected. And we're gonna go through some of the details in the next few slides. Now there's essentially two drivers of the cuts in investment that we see in 2020. Um, one of these is the, the practical disruptions associated with the lockdowns. So these have affected supply chains, uh, labor markets, uh, the ability of companies to get projects up and running. Um, in some cases, the ability to take final investment decision on projects uh, because transactions are not happening. Um, but there's also an economic dynamic of it, which has sort of perhaps longer term implications 
um, that we can investigate here. The economic dynamic is that um, companies have weaker balance sheets uh, as a result of lower energy prices, um, but as a result of lower demand and also expectations of lower demand going forward. So this affects their ability to raise finance. Now we track the revenues um, that, uh, that are accrued by energy companies and governments around the world. So essentially what end users are spending on energy and normally about 90% of their spent expenditures would be on oil and electricity with a smaller role for natural gas and coal. Uh, what we expect because of the pandemic in 2020 is that the revenue position shifts markedly. Um, in particular, revenues would, are expected to decline for the oil industry by about $1 trillion in 2020. Electricity is normally a bit more stable in terms of the revenue picture, but even there we see some important declines and some potential for downside risks as we go through the year, also with the potential for um, weaker economic recovery, which of course we've seen the IMF numbers which have recently come out, which have revised down um, their GDP assumptions that they made um, just in April. How does this translate into investment across the energy sector? Well, um, because of the, the volatility and because of the, the exposure of the fuel supply sector um, to rapid changes in, in oil prices, um, we expect the bulk of the cuts to be concentrated in oil and gas with expenditures, capital expenditures reducing by about one third, but all other sectors also suffer some declines. We'll talk about power in a second, but energy efficiency and end use, which is also very important for energy transition. Um, we see declines of double digit percentage um, due to slower economic activity in terms of construction of new buildings, renovations, um, industrial activity, and also slowing auto sales, which affects the turnover um, of the vehicle fleet. Uh, we also see decline in, in coal supply, uh, but less than that for oil and gas. Now, the previous slide and this slide would suggest to you that the power sector is affected relatively less in terms of capital expenditure reductions, with a decline of about 10%. Uh, but the power sector is really at the heart of many strategies around the world for decarbonization and also economic development. So it's an important sector to follow. And even with a 10% decline in 2020, you have to remember that this is coming on the back of declines for several years now, um, particularly in some subsectors. Um, some of this is to do to lower spending on coal power, which is arguably a, a positive thing for, for energy transition, or at least for reducing emissions. Um, but we also see in 2020, despite some relative resiliency for uh, solar PV and wind and, and other renewables, uh, we see decline in spending in this category, as well as in electricity grids, which is something which is often not appreciated um, by investors in the financial community, the importance of infrastructure and um, particularly infrastructure to integrate new technologies such as renewables. Um, so the investment trends in both of these categories are going down, whereas what we need to see in the long run is a steady rise in these areas. One indicator that we track in particular, which is important for energy transition and, and coal power plants are, are still the largest source of, of CO2 emissions in the world. So it's important to understand um, what's going on in this category. Um, over the past, uh, let's say five years, we've seen a stark reduction in investment decisions for new plants. So these are plants that would be expected to come online in the years ahead. But what we've seen in 2020 gives us cause for a bit of concern or pause. Um, with some emerging economies, China, but also in other places, perhaps looking to traditional economic levers of development, so through sort of cheap fossil fuel power, um, we've seen an uptick in approvals and sanctionings of new plants in just the first quarter of 2020, um, which means that the overall annualized rate is more than twice that seen in, in 2019. Um, like I said, these are plants that would come online in the future, so we have to see um, when they're built and, and if the plans follow through to be built finally. But it's also worth remembering that the coal power fleet is very young in Asia and it continues to expand despite this downward picture that I'm showing you. Um, so not just looking at the role of new technologies, but looking at the role of existing um, infrastructure, which is, has the potential to lock in emissions is important both for policymakers and investors alike. Of course, the power sector is not um, the only sector that matters in terms of energy transition. Um, here we're tracking the sort of portfolio of investments uh, that fall under the rubric of clean energy and also energy efficiency. Um, so this includes technologies used in the direct use 
of renewables for transport, such as biofuels or heat, such as solar, solar thermal heating installations. Um, nuclear is, of course, part of the power sector. We didn't talk about it on the previous slide, but it's an important part of clean energy transitions. Of course, along with the range of energy efficiency improvements, um, but also enabling technologies which are not necessarily producing or saving energy, um, but things like battery storage or carbon capture utilization and storage, um, which are important to facilitate integration of new technologies, um, but also for direct emissions reductions. Now, last year in the World Energy Investment, we said that we needed to go from one third spending on clean energy to about two thirds. And the good news is that this year we see an uptick towards 40% from that one third. But the bad news is that this uptick is coming almost, almost because of the reduction in fossil fuel investment. So it makes the clean energy share uh, look relatively resilient. At the same time, you can see that as the absolute level has remained stable over the past five years, we see a downturn in 2020, whereas clean energy investment over the next 10 years uh, would need to more than double to meet the, um, the goals of the IEA sustainable development scenario. So, and essentially investments are not going where they need to uh, on a technological basis. It's also true on a, um, on a sort of market basis as well. And when we examined what are the pathways to get out of this investment slump, and we examined, okay, who are going to be the, the providers of finance or who's, what are going to be the financing stories that are very important, um, we chose to emphasize a few, which I'll show in the next couple of slides. Um, the first is this potential to stimulate more private-based investment. So this chart shows you the ownership of energy investments that we see in 2019. Um, by the public ownership. So this is state-owned enterprises, national oil companies, governments directly, and then by private ownership. So these are companies either publicly traded or, or privately held. Um, you can see that state-owned enterprises, of course, it's no surprise they play a much bigger role in energy investments in emerging economies, um, but the, set, the, the landscape differs widely by sector. Um, in newer technologies, cleaner technologies, renewables and energy efficiency, it's much more based around private investment, but private investment that's also responding in large part to government incentives, uh, was in other sectors such as in oil and gas, fossil fuel generation, coal generation, state-owned enterprises underpin a lot more of that investment, particularly in emerging economies. Um, so it's that engagement with state-owned enterprises, which is also key to the energy transition. Electricity networks represents a very interesting in-between case um, because it's not necessarily a, a form of energy, but it's the crucial node for integrating renewables and also energy efficiency. And oftentimes in emerging economies, it's the state-owned utilities which are dominant in, in this sphere. So understanding the risks associated with those are and the, how this affects financing um, is critical for energy transition. In advanced economies, there's a broader range of financing options, and we've examined in more detail, uh, the role of institutional investors in particular. Um, in the next few slides, we'll focus on the role of the capital markets and the role that they play in energy investment with a kind of orientation towards energy transition. The first thing we looked at was public equity markets. Um, so we did a joint analysis with the Imperial College Center of Climate Finance, where we constructed uh, renewable power portfolios and fossil fuel portfolios. We looked at those over the past five years. The focus was on Europe and the United States, although in subsequent analysis, we'd like to expand um, and take more of a global view. Um, but over the past five years, what we found is that for investors, so those investing in publicly listed equities, it could actually make good financial sense to invest in renewables versus fossil fuel supply, which is kind of contrary to the historical view of how risk and returns have shaped up around the energy system. So over the past five years, the renewable portfolio had displayed higher level of returns um, with lower volatility, so lower risk, than the fossil fuel portfolio. What we saw as well in 2020 is that this result also holds up, and that's what you see in the graph here. And it suggests that not just from a capital expenditure point of view, but also from a financial performance point of view, we are seeing signs that um, investments in renewables and other clean energy technologies um, can be relatively resilient from the perspective of both, both companies and investors. Of course, there's a policy element here, which is important. And there's also uh, structural elements which prevent investment in renewables by institutional investors. This has to deal with the scale of the companies involved, the ability to kind of separate out pure play companies and the liquidity. Um, and these factors are still holding back investment 
in renewables compared to fossil fuels. At least that was the, the conclusion of the joint paper, the joint analysis that we did with them. Another route, and, and noting that um, other consultancies, I think McKinsey has, has noted that the bulk of renewables investment in the next decade is not going to necessarily come through public markets. It's going to come through unlisted companies, unlisted projects. Um, so getting um, investors involved or giving them routes to invest in projects directly is going to be increasingly important. Uh, one thing we looked at in the World Energy Investment was their role in refinancing and acquisition of projects and all sorts of energy projects. Um, this slide here focuses on kind of larger scale energy supply projects. We also looked at um, aggregation of smaller scale investments through, for example, securitization, which is more suitable for things like distributed PV and energy efficiency. Um, but here we're really looking at sort of bigger projects and how investors play a role in those. Um, the trend is that over the past decade, we've seen an increase in acquisitions and refinancings in general. We've seen institutional investors play a larger role and also a tilt towards things like renewables and infrastructure um, with perceived reliable cash flows. Of course, this is a phenomenon we see largely in advanced economies and less in emerging economies. So it'd be good perhaps during the discussion to reflect upon um, how investors can play a role more in the projects uh, and investment in emerging economies. And so the last two points I'll touch upon um, before turning it back over to Tim is this backdrop, this larger backdrop of sustainable finance. So this, this growing recognition by capital markets of the potential risks posed to portfolios uh, due to climate risks. There's a broad push from investors and both regulators on around um, initiatives for engagement and divestment. Um, so the chart on the left shows you climate related shareholder resolutions that have been made against oil and gas companies, so showing this investor engagement. And then the chart on the right shows you another trend, um, which is related, which is disclosure and assessment of climate-related risks. So we looked at all the companies who were disclosing um, emissions metrics, um, policies around CO2, efficiency, et cetera, um, in the S&P 500. Um, and compared to what it was a decade ago, these, these numbers are very high although it shows you that not all these companies are reporting. So there's a bit of fragmentation in terms of the amount of data that we're getting from companies to do these risk, risk assessments. Um, there's also better efforts to classify investments. So this is coming about through things like the EU taxonomy, but also other countries are uh, developing sustainable taxonomies. So all of these forces or trends are kind of um, increasing investor interest in sustainability, as well as the companies they invest in. Um, that said, it's also worth noting that publicly traded companies account for less than a quarter of direct emissions, so scope one emissions. Um, so it's not just those publicly listed companies which matter, which investors can directly influence, um, but it's also supply chains of privately held companies of state-owned enterprises, um, which, which matter a lot for that sort of um, rest of emissions that are being produced in the world. And this trend of sustainable finance has resulted in a very strong um, inflow of uh, finance into sustainable debt in particular. So um, this is very much the green bond story, um, but it's diversified in terms of the types of instruments and the sort of um, purposes these instruments can, can, can serve. Um, largely, these instruments are going to help fund or finance renewables, energy efficiency, other sort of emissions reductions. Um, activities, but they're also diversifying in the sense that sustainability linked debt is helping companies to um, tie the issuance of green debt to performance metrics rather than use of proceeds. Um, we've seen more interest in the issuance of things like transition bonds to help um, companies, incumbent companies or legacy companies uh, reduce their emissions. Um, and so the sort of instrument universe is expanding in the way that both investors and companies can take advantage of this broader trend of sustainable finance, um, but yet it still remains rather small as a share of total debt issuance. And then I would also remind you that given the chart on the left and the chart we showed before on clean energy capital expenditures, we've seen a lot more growth in terms of the financial flows, but not as much growth in terms of the actual capital expenditures. So there's a fair amount of refinancing going on or expansion of funding options, um, but this hasn't necessarily translated into an overall increase in the size of the pie for, for clean energy investment. So it could be interesting to discuss some of the reasons why in the Q&A. With that, I will leave with you with the conclusions. Uh, many of these I've already emphasized in the presentation, so I won't go through it, um, but I'll just emphasize in particular 
uh, the fourth point, which is something that um, um, is, is very good for an investor audience, I think that we're, we're talking to here. Um, it's, there's a lot of growing effort by governments and investors to try to align financial flows with what's going on in the real economy, um, but there's more engagement and strategies that also need to be made with those entities which investors may not be able to invest in directly. So the state-owned enterprises, the unlisted companies, um, which still account for a good portion of the emissions, um, but also a good uh, portion of the, the energy decisions which are taken, particularly in emerging economies. Um, and with that, maybe I would turn it back over to, to Tim, uh, who I think is going to pass the floor then to our, our next speaker. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mike. And, and I'm, I'm delighted to see that Simon Sharps joined us from the UK Cabinet Office. I mean, you, you talked about this historic plunge in energy investment. Um, the sharpest declines in oil and gas supply, um, still a slowdown in those clean energy technologies at a time when we really need to see that picking up. And um, I'd like to turn to, to Simon now with, with many thanks for joining us uh, to talk through, you know, what, did, what does that mean to you from a policy perspective? You know, how do you think through these, uh, these investment finance issues, particularly given your, your role within the cabinet office as a deputy director for COP26 uh, policy themes? So uh, Simon, over to you. Hi, Tim. Thanks very much. And um, so I missed the first few minutes as I was trying to get my computer to work as normal. Um, great, great government IT that we're used to. I'm going to try and share my screen. Can you tell me if this is working? Is it letting you see it? Tim, is it is it showing my screen? I think you're on mute, Tim. I've made you the presenter, so maybe if you try again now. Okay, thank you. How's that? There we go. Yeah. No, they're it's very good. Up. Carry on. Okay, great. Just have to make it so. There we go. All right. Thanks. Well, um, Look, it's, it's excellent to see all that analysis from the IEA. And in fact, um, this, this report on investment and the other one on the, on the recovery and transition that came out the other day, um, both been incredibly helpful for uh, thinking through what, what we all need to do right now. Um, I'm gonna talk about, if I can make this work, I hope I can, here we go. Right, so we're taking on this, this presidency role of COP26 at a time when we need to go hugely faster. Um, to be on track for the Paris goals, we need to decarbonize the global economy about three times faster or even five times faster if, if we wanna hit one and a half degrees. Um, that sounds almost impossible, but I think there's a couple of reasons why it's not completely impossible. One is just to think that in each of these sectors that we need to decarbonize, we are still quite early on in the transition. We're at the upward swing of the S-curve, and this is where exponential growth in the new technologies is just beginning to happen. And so, in fact, there's a huge amount of acceleration that can happen. The second is, is that if we work together, we really can make progress faster. And um, so the way we're thinking about our presidency role is on top of the, the strong consensus that we hope to emerge through the negotiations and the strong national action that's envisaged in the Paris Agreement, nationally determined contributions, we also need strong international cooperation. We need to be working together in each of these sectors to accelerate up the S-curve. When, when I think about finance, then um, I actually think that the most important thing is the way that it interacts with policy and with technology. That what really gets things moving in transitions is this reinforcing feedback between policy, finance and technology, and in fact, influence of, of actors that are aligned with the transition. Um, and I, I think this is quite um, in tune with the way it's thought about um, in the investor agenda, where they talk about the critical role of policy, 
um, providing the signals and incentives to direct the flow of capital across the global economy. Um, and they also talk about the, the four sort of roles for investors in catalyzing transitions, investment itself, corporate engagement, investor disclosure and policy advocacy. So this diagram comes from a report that we released at COP25 on how to accelerate low carbon transitions. And I've just sort of added on it where those particular investor roles come in. But one thing I, I, I want to emphasize is that the importance of taking a, a different look in each sector where emissions come from. Because I find of, often the, um, the conversation about finance and climate change takes a very economy-wide view. Um, but as, as we've just heard, um, the power sector has got its own particular characteristics. And those are actually quite different from the other sectors where large amounts of emissions come from, from the different transport subsectors, industrial subsectors, land use and buildings. If you just think about the, the dominant financial flows in each of those, then um, in the power sector, state-owned utilities, governments um, take a, a very important role, especially in emerging economies, as we just saw. Whereas in the road transport, it's much more industrial capital, firms deciding where to allocate their investment. And if we look at land use, then the financial flows that really matter are the value of internationally traded commodities, the ones that lead to deforestation. So we need to take a, a very targeted approach to each sector. That's true of the policy, it's true of the diplomacy, and I think it's true of the investment too. Um, so I'm going to talk a, a little bit about two sectors where we are running campaigns um, in COP26, trying to get countries to work together to make progress faster. Um, first power and then road transport. In the power sector, I, I think several people will know that we started something called the Powering Past Coal Alliance about three or four years ago. And this is a group of countries, investors and other actors committed to phasing out unabated coal from the power sector as fast as we can. This has really grown now. It's, it's up to the government members cover one third of the coal plants in the OECD. So this is now really um, beginning to shape investor perceptions and policymaker perceptions all over the world, strengthening that, that perception that coal really is on its way out. And I share this graph just to illustrate that these kind of perceptions really matter. When I was working on the UK industrial strategy a few years ago, then this was a chart that we put right at the beginning of the section on clean growth. And it was just illustrating how um, coal stocks were going down and green bond issuance was going up. And it, it's very simple. And of course, these lines, you can look at them over different timescales and see different things. But it's these kind of perceptions really are quite instrumental in shaping political uh, decisions about priorities. Um, but of course, um, phasing out coal. So as I say, the Powering Past Coal Alliance is growing. We've, we've had new investors joining that. Um, it's getting stronger and stronger. But at the same time, uh, we've got to strengthen investment in clean power. And although renewables are, are the cheapest source of new power in most of the world now, or the blue and yellow bits on, on this map, um, they're not the cheapest everywhere. You can see coal is, is still the cheapest source in quite a bit of Southeast Asia as well as Japan. And there are other places, Africa and, and parts of South Asia where it's not clear. So one of the things we want to do through COP26 is make sure that every country that might be considering new coal power has access to a clean power investment and assistance offer that is more attractive. This isn't about political pressure, it's about making the clean option more attractive, which it should be. Um, but as we know, this, this depends hugely on policy. And just as, as an example of, of the critical role of policy, this is what's happened with offshore wind in the UK. Um, back only, only about six years ago, some, some of the most well-known energy economists in the UK were saying that offshore wind was a terrible idea, 
it was one of the most expensive forms of emissions reduction known to man. In, in the, the few years since then, the costs have come down dramatically. Over a decade, they've dropped by more than two thirds. And the contracts being signed now, we expect if, if prices for electricity go back to their recent levels, then we expect um, these offshore wind projects to generate below the market price. That means every time they generate electricity, they will actually pay money back into the treasury that we can spend on whatever we like. So this is the opposite of subsidy. This is clean energy with a negative subsidy, a, a dividend back to the public. And when you look at, this is from a report that the Carbon Trust did. It looked at the drivers of this huge cost reduction. Uh, they broke it down into those different categories you see on the right. And they estimated about 80% of that cost reduction came as a result of market creating policy. So of course, as, as that market grew, finance came in from more and more sources, the pension funds started coming in from around about 2010, and the cost of capital kept on going down, which helped bring the cost down and, and keep on growing the market. So that was the critical role for policy. We need a similar thing to be happening in all these other countries. And I think one of the most important things investors can do is engage very seriously, very deeply with regulators and with governments to help them understand what are the critical policy measures they need to take to enable huge volumes of finance to flow to clean energy. Um, my friend Kirsty Hamilton in Chatham House calls it investment grade policy. That's what's needed. I think that's a very good way of describing it. So we want to work with you, investors, with the IEA, Clean Energy Ministerial and the rest to make sure um, this really is the way all countries want to go. But shifting the, the new power investment is obviously not enough. We have about 2000 gigawatts of existing operating coal in the world, and we have to figure out a way of phasing that out more quickly. Um, this is, is showing here that some expectations for uh, clean power to become cheaper than existing coal. This is new renewables cheaper than existing coal. This is already outdated. This has been up graphs from three years ago. I couldn't find one from 2020, but uh, there's been some more recent analysis from RMI, uh, which finds that if you just phased out the coal plants that are already uncompetitive with new renewables, you could save $39 billion in 2020. And they reckon that in five years, 70% of the global coal fleet will be uncompetitive with new renewables plus storage. They thought you could save $140 billion in 2025 by ditching that uncompetitive existing coal. So that's very hopeful, but the major barrier to getting this done is, is of course, the need for a just transition um, and the, the need for those communities and provincial governments often that are dependent on those jobs and those revenues to have somewhere hopeful to go. And so I think that the real opportunity is to take those cost savings from moving away from uncompetitive coal and invest that money in regional development, new industries, new jobs and social support for a just transition. That's, that's possible but it's difficult and it will still need investment to, to make that shift, to get over the hump. Um, anyone who's following the situation with ESCOM in South Africa will know that that is far from simple. But I think there's, there's a really important role for investors in supporting that kind of transition. Again, working with governments and regulators and international expert agencies like the IEA to help countries that, that are willing to undertake a serious transition design the investment and policy strategy that allows them to do that. So that's, that's enough on power. I wanted to briefly mention transport. Transport is really exciting um, road transport. That is not just for the emissions that come from road transport itself, which could be saved, um, but also the fact that if we have a rapid transition here, it will scale up batteries very quickly, bringing down their cost, which will facilitate faster uh, decarbonization of the power sector. It will also um, take away the largest market for oil and increase the incentives for the oiling companies to invest somewhere else. So this is a really exciting transition. 
it keeps everybody's estimates of the pace of this transition keep being revised upwards they're very rarely revised downwards having said all of that we need to double the pace of this transition this this is the most optimistic um, estimate i've seen from bnf just over half of new cars globally to be electric vehicles by 2040 we need roughly all of them to be zero emission by that date so we've got to double the pace of the transition there are countries in this table on the right that already have targets for 100 percent zero emission vehicle new sales um, there's a chance for much larger markets to come in and join them there are actually only three jurisdictions that between them make up half of global car sales as the eu china and california and if those three club together they could really shift things very quickly so that's that's one of the ways we hope to make progress over the coming year and a half again Policy plays a critical role here. You compare the, the EU and the US, and you can see over the last decade or so, the EU has had much tougher standards, and it's driven much higher levels of investment in its auto sector. Uh, the EU firms, EU industry's share of total global auto sector R&D went up by about 10 percentage points over that decade, while the US share went down. It's quite an achievement for the European industry to increase its market, its share of total investment at a time when China, of course, was hugely increasing its share. Similarly, um, policy leads to faster market growth. You can see that the, the blue of Europe um, outperforming the dark green of the US, but in fact, both of them being beaten by China. Um, and, and so Looking at the role of investors here, I think it, this, is, this is where the corporate engagement part is particularly important. The auto manufacturers face a dilemma. The future of the market in this sector is incredibly clear for them. They all know where it's going. But at the moment, they're still losing money on every electric vehicle that they sell. Um, and so they, they have a very powerful short-term incentive to keep doing what they do um, and, and basically milk their current assets. Of course, uh, they're all they're all facing extreme difficulties right now as well because of the the economic crisis, which has completely taken away sales from many of them. So it's it's not an easy time for them. Um, but I I think for investors, especially long term investors, there's a real role in encouraging the firms to to take a long view and invest heavily in the future, uh, not be stuck in the past. So. Um, Simon, uh, we're not hearing you. I'm not sure if we have a technology gap here. Well, Simon, in which case, I think that Just was from one technology. Oh, ah, here we are. Oh, sorry. Did I fall out? Um, certainly for me, yes, but. Uh, Okay, um, I'm not sure exactly where I fell out. Yeah, you're you're on your final slide. Okay, well, I've just just I'll try to wrap up because it seems like my computer's doing something funny. Um, but clearly, the important thing is invest in the, the new technologies, invest in that whole ecosystem. If you invest in not just the cars but also the batteries and the charging infrastructure, all of those things will be mutually reinforcing. And of course, there's there's massive returns to be made. So don't get stuck investing in the horses. Thanks. Right, Simon, thank you so much for those remarks. I mean, lots to ponder there. I mean, but I think the key thing that we'll probably come back to is this rein, these reinforcing feedbacks between policy, technology and finance. And with that, I would like to ask um, if, if uh, Simon, you can stay uh, with us and if you can come on the screen, then um, likewise, Michael, but also our distinguished panel, um, Rothwein Kupus, uh, Managing Director and Head of Responsible Investments at DWS, um, Torsten Fels, who's the CEO of Pensan, the like state Danish uh, pension company, and uh, Kai Buntruck, who's Director of Finance at uh, Goldbeck Solar.
Um, and perhaps I can start, uh, well, I start by thanking you very much for, uh, for, for joining us today and also by reminding our uh, participants that you're very welcome to submit any questions uh, that you have uh, through the browser and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, but maybe we can start uh, with an invitation to Rolfin, to Kai or to Torsten if you had any particular remarks or comments or questions that arose out of those presentations that you wanted to uh, to raise immediately? Uh, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's Rolfine. I'm happy to go first. Uh, first of all, thank you for um, inviting me. And um, also, thank you to um, the presenters for very good presentations. I have a couple of uh, points to make, and maybe that's how we can start our discussion. First of all, I would like to congratulate the governments of Denmark and Germany and the UK um, for all the very good work and examples that they're setting the world um, in this particular area. Um, um, Denmark specifically spoke about public-private partnerships, and, and we at DWS believe that that is absolutely key. Um, for example, at DWS, we work with the European Investment Bank on an, uh, a European Energy Efficiency Fund, with KFW on an African Agricultural Fund, and we were accredited by the UN Green Climate Fund to build a renewable fund, uh, a renewable energy fund for Africa, helping African countries to meet their um, uh, their uh, Paris uh, Agreement targets. So first and foremost, I think public-private partnerships are of great importance. I also would like to highlight the point that was made that renewable, uh, you know, there was a chart on, on equities and it showed that renewable, equi uh, renewable energy equities have outperformed fossil fuel companies. And we at DWS very much believe that COVID-19 is coinciding with peak oil. Um, we have done a lot of work on um, factoring in transition risk, climate transition risk, from moving from a high carbon to a low carbon economy. And it's interesting that just in the last two weeks, we have seen both BP and Royal Dutch Shell come through with very significant write downs on their, um, on their, uh, on their reserves. The third point uh, that I'd like to make is with regards to engagement. Um, there's been a lot of um, talk in the presentations around more engagement. DWS is part of Climate Action 100 Plus, uh, and we would encourage a lot more asset owners and asset managers to become part of that particular network because it is very powerful in, in engaging with um, the world's largest polluting companies in, in changing their behavior. Um, and I would also like to make a point around the policy point that was made, uh, uh, that was made earlier. Um, not enough um, uh, asset managers are uh, are engaging when it comes to government advocacy. Uh, currently, only four of the largest 20 uh, asset managers signed the 2019 investor letter to governments calling for stronger climate policies, and DWS was one of those. So we would very much encourage other uh, asset owners and asset managers to really get more involved within with that particular debate as well. And I just finally want to make a point that uh, Clearly, it is very important that we all keep in mind that the just transition is uh, is absolutely key, so that we don't uh, and and that we have policies in place to deal with the people that will be left behind as we transition to a greener uh, economy and and greener energy systems around the world. Thank you very much, Rolfin. Would either Kai or Torsten like to step in? Yes, uh, I, I would like to give a, a few comments. Um, Thorsten Fels from Pensum in Denmark. I think, of course, it was a very interesting presentation we just heard. Uh, one of the issues that I find quite interesting and also uh, quite worrying was, of course, that we see investments in, in, in uh, renewables are not increasing enough uh, in order to cope with the goals, the sustainability goals we have set up. I think uh, it was mentioned before also from Simon that it's so important that we have the collaboration between the different parts, the government, the, the, the investors and so on. Uh, last autumn I had uh, the opportunity to take place in the, the UN Climate Action uh, Meeting Summit in, uh, in New York and uh, the Danish pension sector together with the government made a commitment for investing 50 billion US dollars in the next decade uh, in uh, the transition to to um, to green energy 
So I think we have a very clear cooperation between the private sector and the government in Denmark, and, and this is what is pushing uh, things quite heavily right now. For instance, just in, in Pensum as a, as a pension fund, we are doubling our yearly investments in the green transition uh, in the next four years. Of course, the COVID-19 crisis have affected us like anybody else, but at the same time, we are a long-term investor. So uh, the basic uh, investment strategy that we have in Pensum are not affected. So right now in, in, in the first half of, of uh, 2020, we have in fact increased our uh, investments in this green transition. Uh, we just heard that uh, when, we when it comes to listed securities, we can see that we lack uh, both uh, scale and liquidity. That's part of the reason why we are investing more directly uh, investments in, for instance, solar and, and wind projects. We have invested quite heavily in these areas. Uh, it makes it easier for us to, to uh, go in and have an exactly uh, view on the exposure we want to have. Um, of course, it's a lot more complex to go to get into these direct investments. So we have to collaborate. And, and that's another part, uh, an, an important part of it. We have to do it together. We are doing it uh, mostly together with another Danish pension fund, uh, PKA, and uh, we have established a, a joint investment partner, uh, a PI, AIP, so, uh, who are making these di uh, investments directly. My last point, uh, we were talking about emerging economies and the difficulties here. Here we also have an example in Denmark where we are uh, working together, the government and the, the private sector. Six Danish pension funds together with the Danish government have formed what we call the uh, SDP investment fund in Denmark. Half of the capital comes from the government, half from the private sector, and together we are making investments in emerging econ economies in a way where we both are uh, working with the transition we need, but also doing it in a professional way where we have to see that we can uh, make a return to, to our members of our pension fund. Thank you. Thanks very much, Justin. And maybe a few words from Kai. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, what that shows to me, and, and thanks for Golfin and, and, and Torsten to give that introduction as well, it's um, how intertwined these things are and, and the core and key elements I take away from Michael's and Simon's um, brief presentations was resilience, disclosure and, and regulatory impact and, and that what is what I feel as well. And I, I will, uh, during the course of our, of our brief um, dialogue, look to give a bit of an inclusive um, feedback as I have worked as a development banker with KWDG, I've worked for a listed uh, utility as an investor, I've, I was CFO of a emerging market focused renewables project developer and now I'm head of finance for an investor operator and, and construction in renewable projects. So uh, m my feedback will be, will be comprised from these different angles and um, what drives me most is it is a combination of things. It's not just an investment in energy. It's not just an inven investment in power. It's an investment in people and planet. Um, and I think that is something that we may be, be touching more on later on with all these uh, uh, buzzwords nowadays of ESG and impact investment, something that Torsten already mentioned, uh, the SDGs as an investment corridor. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see which route to take. And, and, and I will touch on, the, on these different perspectives from my background. That's great. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, I'd like to come back to, to, to Rothi now. Um, you know, clearly, as Michael's presentation showed, I mean, there have been impacts on the flows of capital to different clean energy technologies. I mean, what's your perception about which risks do you worry about that may have been exacerbated by the crisis uh, when it comes to looking at financing some of these, uh, some of these investments? Yeah, thank, thank you um, for that question. Um, first of all, I, I should say that I'm an optimist um, and, um, and I believe that what COVID-19 has shown us um, is that we clearly, as a human species, cannot handle uh, a global pandemic. I mean, clearly the numbers are speak for themselves with over 10 million people infected and over 500,000 people who have tragically died as a result of COVID-19. And 
and as the COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, started to materialize in the last uh, couple of months, I was very concerned that climate change would take a, a, a back, uh, would go back onto the back burner, that that would not be um, what, what people would be most interested in from an investment point of view or from a public policy um, point of view. However, um, I think, uh, uh, and, and lucky enough, uh, that, that concern that I had um, turned out not to be uh, not, not to be uh, too troublesome um, because COVID-19 from a financial markets point of view is very much a black swan event but with climate change we know it's here um, we know it's 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 here to to stay and we also know that we have a limited time to address it before it, it is too late and as Winston Churchill says said never let a serious crisis go to waste we, we've talked a lot about public policy and, and the need for public policy, but it's also important for public policy to be formed that the public actually is behind um, uh, the public policy that, that governments want to put forward. And what is clear during the pandemic is that during the lockdown phase of the pandemic, people suddenly saw blue skies uh, over major cities like London, lower levels of air pollution, clean water in the Venetian lagoon. So that is starting to change the public's perception and the public's voice. And the public is, is seeing that if we cannot deal with the pandemic, then we certainly can't deal with the severe issues of climate change. So as we look at all the, um, all the stimulus programs that have come out, uh, currently and counting, uh, we have identified about $13 trillion of, of stimulus. And to the person who is speaking for the, on behalf of the German government to, to build back better, it is really encouraging to see that the EU at this point has committed 750 billion euros to a green recovery plan putting climate change very much uh, at the heart of it. And this is important because that will also, back to the Danish point, hopefully, and, and that, that's the plan of the EU as well, that this will trigger another 350 billion euros in private investments. And this is also important because as part of the um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, it is estimated that over 400 million people are unemployed globally. So governments really should focus their stimulus also on stimulus that creates jobs. And um, we have um, uh, done some recent research, but what that research shows is that for every 1 million euros invested, uh, 19 jobs are created in energy efficiency, and that compares to only 2.65 jobs in, fuel, in fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. so, all, all, all in all, um, to, sum, to summarize, um, we believe that uh, capital will continue to be allocated to clean energy. At DWS uh, ourselves, similarly to um, Pensum, we have significant investments in our, our um, infrastructure private equity funds, for example, in solar and in wind farms and other renewable energy. And in our impact investing area, we have significant investments um, that work with renewable energy in, in emerging economies. So it is imperative to us that this trend continues. But as I mentioned in the beginning, I am an optimist and I am hopeful, hopeful that if anything, the public's voice will become clearer, and that is the public voice when it comes to setting public policy, but it is also the public po voice of retirees um, and savers whose ultimate uh, stewards we, we, are, uh, we are a fiduciary of, whether that is as an asset owner, as Pensam is, or as it is as an asset, uh, as an asset manager, as DWS is. So I remain hopeful for the future and believe that uh, um, that more financing will ultimately move towards um, uh, towards uh, green energy. And to the earlier point that I made uh, in response to the presentations, uh, it is also from an investment uh, risk and return po uh, point of view, a, a very good area for uh, investors to be invested in. Uh, thanks very much, um, Rolfin. I mean, just a, a note to our esteemed panel, but also to participants. I'm going to take another 10 minutes to continue this discussion. So, uh, you know, beyond the initial uh, uh, time allotted in the in the agenda, I hope that's okay with uh, with everyone. Um, 
I'd like to turn to Torsten. I mean, you made a very interesting comment in your in your initial remark about the need to finance these kinds of projects also in developing economies. I mean, one question came through pointing out that um, you know, in many of these uh, many of these economies in the developing world, debts have really ballooned. Balance sheets across the board are strained by the uh, the the effects of the uh, of the of the pandemic. Uh, you know, aid budgets might get squeezed. So, you know, the question is, are, are we not? Are you worried about there being perhaps a sort of two-tiered system whereby, in some markets in Europe, you know, there's ample uh, finance for clean energy projects, but in in some of the other parts of the world, which were shown on the map uh, that that Simon put up, you know, then that that sort of access is not at all uh, guaranteed. So, who finances those kinds of projects in the developing world? What needs to happen? Yeah. I mean, it's a good question. Uh, as I just mentioned, we have, we, I think we have uh, committed ourselves to to take part in uh, in these type of investments. But I also have to be clear that uh, as a pension fund, we need to find the, the right balance between the risk we take and and that we get a, a, a reasonable and a good return to our members of uh, the pension fund. So. Uh, uh, to be uh, honest, uh, most of our investments uh, are within uh, developed economies, uh, but we do also take our uh, our part of the transformation of emerging markets. And that's why we are doing it together in a way where we are risk sharing with the government of Denmark. And we're doing it in a way where we can uh, put together the efforts, the, the, the knowledge and the uh, what we are, uh, what we have of uh, of information from uh, from uh, the government part of uh, foreign ministry and so on, in order to to see where where are we able to do it in the in circumstances where political risks are not uh, getting out of control. But I would say uh, it, it's so important. What what is exciting about all this is, is the commitment that we're seeing from from uh, the public, from the governments. I think it's a it's a great political momentum we are seeing. Uh, one thing is the European Green Deal, but uh, in in Denmark, I'm I'm very pleased about having a situation where the Danish government and it is all parties within the Danish government who have uh, backed and pushed the ambitious agenda of uh, seeing a reduce reduce reducing of uh, our carbon uh, emission by 70% in 2030 and that's that's a very that's a very uh, difficult target to reach uh, everybody is uh, contributing to this we are uh, as as uh, investors uh, i think we have a solid position for uh, using our ability as a long term investor to uh, to get the right balance in in these areas i just mentioned what we have uh, financed of uh, of these uh, more traditional parts of wind and solar uh, uh, farms, but it's also to look into the, some of the new topics, other sectors. Uh, it could be carbon capturing, it could be power to X, uh, etc. So, so it's not just to do what we are used to do, but also to look into new opportunities. Uh, one of uh, one of the areas where we have a lot of energy consumptions are in fact in within buildings and as a pension company we do have a, a real estate portfolio that is quite significant so so one of the ways that we are working with these issues also to to make it more energy efficient and and by that we can in fact uh, change uh, quite sustainable sustainable but also significantly within our investment portfolio uh, one of the things I will mention also is, uh, as part of this uh, government agenda uh, about reducing carbon uh, uh, by by 70 percent, there's been a collaboration with with all sectors within Denmark. In fact, we ha have agreed on 13 cli uh, climate partnerships also within the finance sector in order to make exact plans for how to how to develop in the in the next years. So. If I should conclude on, on this, I would say it's so important that we find the right balance between what governments are setting of mm. rules and uh, are uh, supporting the, the possibilities for the private sector. Because uh, if we if we should use uh, all um, 
all the ambitions we have for for the green 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 transition we also need to have uh, a government system supporting it in a way where where we can do it without being uh, in a situation where we shall uh, uh, go with all the difficulties in in legislation and and other things I, we we have seen in some regions uh, politicians stepping away from what they promised before that's that's really poison for private capital to to go into these type of investments so we we need to see these alliance uh, between uh, the parties that's so important well continuing that theme maybe i can turn to kai um, mm. because I, i'm very interested in your expectations what 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 do you what do you look for now from the policymakers um what what other instruments could you think would be helpful also from from the from the financing side and that could help to scale up these kinds of clean energy investments yeah, I'm happy to comment on that. And I think we, we've been hinted towards these elements uh, in, in Thorsten's and, and Olyf's, Olyf's, um, um inputs just now. And if, you, if I would ask the participants to take, a war, to take away four areas uh, to dive into later on, it's, it's just the four. It's TLC, it's ESG, it's 3D, and it's, um, if you like, uh, disclosure. So TLC is, I'm not talking about the tender love and care, but, but Torsten just mentions it. What capital hates most and what is most scared about is insecurity. And so the TLC is that we need um, transparency in regulatory regimes, we need long liberty and we need certainty. And that is something that I know from a project developer's perspective, because if I develop a wind project, I have six years time to market in, in solar that is much faster, which is nice. An element we won't be touching upon, but uh, that's why renewables in particular can be playing such a large part in, in the recovery efforts due to their short time to market. So there's a lot of capital that can actually be allocated in the shortest possible amount of time by at the same time investing into people, resilience and economic inclusion. So the second was ESG. Uh, seems a buzzword. Um, the multilaterals, the development banks I've been part of in the past have been working in that environment 50 years. It is basically including inner environmental, social and governance risks into your overall pricing and risk uh, valuation in, of your investment. And luckily now it shows that ESG inclusive strategies that are more active and direct and yet again another uh, good argument for Torsten's mentioning of, of investing more directly into renewables or energy invest or energy efficiency investments they have outperformed traditional um, um, strategies and even before COVID-19 uh, the third was 3D the 3D is basically um, the 3D of, of, of modern energy system um, outlook uh, decarbonize decentralize and digit digitalize so at the end of the day, those three elements drive the flexibility of a network, drive the resilience of a network, and at the same time allow for a higher than traditional or oil and gas driven uh, energy investment portfolio because of lower volatility and a long-term uh, interest outperformance. So yet again, another, another um, pro argument for, for DWSs and, 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 and Pension investors, for example. That is at, at the last point, I, I would like to skip what I said before, but it's think of integration. And the buzzwords for us is for policymakers and investors alike to get a better understanding and be capacity built in terms of their risk perception and to understand that an investment in a resilient infrastructure that renewables is only a part of. Um, is an investment in people and economic well-being for most. Um, so integrated energies or sector coupling, integrating the housing sector, integrating energy efficiency, integrating distributed and, and decentralized energy generation with and through renewables and storage, for example, on top of that. That is something one needs to look at in, in the future more aggressively from my perspective to integrate the different forms and to actually have not just a building back better, but a building forward. Michael Liebreich in a talk a, a couple of weeks back just said building back versus building forward. And I think the building back better is, is, a, is, a, is a precise and very, very much um, to be supported initiative. 
but building forward is something that we from an energy uh, perspective and developer as well as, as as investor perspective would like to label it more strongly and policymakers should not underestimate their regulatory impact be it on the energy system side but just as well on the financial sector side because at the end of the day um, money makes the world go round unless Tosten, uh, Leufien and, and their colleagues don't allocate larger amounts of money, be it, be it partially public, be it private, be it pension funds, insurances, into the just transition, into a more resilient system, inclusive of clean energies. Um, we won't see the growth that you already hinted uh, towards earlier on that we need. And, and how is that achieved? The TLC. A regulatory impact on the on the energy markets just as well as on the financial markets so to allow and and push mandate push disclosure and transparency just as well as standardization in the financial sector and financial markets just as well as uh, as across energy markets and that provides the TLC that the investors actually need in order to put more money into what we all um, see as a more resilient and a more powerful just transition investment. That's great. Thanks very much, Kai. Uh, well, look, I'm very conscious of the time, so I'm, we're going to move to, to unfortunately, to, to wrap up the discussion. So maybe I could ask, with, uh, with sincere thanks for their participation, if, if Rothin, Kai and Torsten can, uh, can leave the screen. I just wanted to check with, uh, with Simon if you wanted to come back on any of those points. Um, before, I'd also like to invite uh, Hannah back onto the screen. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. I mean, I, I think we're all extremely like-minded. Um, I, I think the one, the one thing I'd just emphasize is, is that difference between the different sectors. We've spoken a lot about energy, um, of the power sector in this discussion, um, but it's really worth thinking about how different road transport is, how different the soft commodities are that are relevant to deforestation, um, agriculture itself, buildings of course um, and I think um, if investors really want to help accelerate these transitions then they need to think about each one of those sectors um, to develop the in-house expertise and capability for allocating their funds in the right way and to engage with with governments as we've been talking about in each of those sectors in the appropriate way so that's that's the thought I'd finish with thank you that's that's great, Simon. Thanks ever so much. And I think Michael is also still on the line from uh, from from the Germany. Michael. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, any, any, yeah. any final thoughts from your side? Well, uh, I don't want to take up uh, much time. Uh, just thanks for the extremely interesting discussion, and uh, I probably walk away with a um, um, sense of optimism um, that. Um, well, what we need in um, efficient and uh, good interplay between um, what governments have to do and the role of private investors. Uh, when I look at the to-do list um, we have in the European Union, um, as we are um, pushing forward the Green Deal and the uh, well, um, various strategies uh, to be tabled by the European Commission in the second half of this year, to, to make progress on that, and uh, that uh, Germany as the um, Council Presidency well, has the um, honor to be instrumental uh, to, to move forward as much as we can. Um, and before the end of the year, we have, uh, well, we're doing, uh, we're taking the right steps in, 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 the, in the good direction um, to, to, to create the best framework possible for um, the investments uh, we need really to happen. So, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, Hannah, it uh, remains to you to have, well, you had the, the, the opening word and now the, the final thoughts uh, of this webinar. Yes, thank you. And thank you very much for all the, these uh, presentations and also for, for the discussion. I think uh, there was a lot of interesting uh, points being made. And I think that what we can uh, take with us is definitely that it was clearly confirmed that, that policy, technology and finance is, is clearly linked and that there is a lot of good reasons why we should collabor collaborate um, and keep the conversation going between uh, between governments and institutional investors and private investors. There, there's there are really a lot of things we can 
we can uh, can do together, I think, and a lot of uh, knowledge we should share amongst us. And I think that um, I really hope that also with uh, this climate climate um, no, sorry, uh, clean energy ministerial investment and finance in initiative, we can we can uh, take some of these uh, issues up, which were raised today. Uh, so uh, so I look forward to to continuing to working with with you. Uh, in the future in, in this context. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very important final thought because certainly from my perspective, uh, thinking about areas that the IEA can deepen its work on, um, I very much share the view that Simon expressed. Um, you know, we need to think about, we need to think about where the emissions are. And we need to think about the fact that the power sector will not resolve all of the issues. We need to look at some of the other areas too, transport industry and so on and find workable business models for decarbonization in those areas as well. And, and likewise, um, broaden our horizons also to think about some of the specific barriers in, the, in, uh, in, in, in developing economies, you know, getting, uh, getting that flow of bankable projects uh, increased over time. Um, with that, I think it remains only to thank very much our speakers today, and also to thank very much uh, our participants. I, I'm apologies that we didn't get to all of the fascinating questions that were put there, um, but uh, we, we do have the possibility to get back to some of you directly and, and we'll endeavour to do that uh, in, in the coming days. So with that, uh, thanks again and we hope to see you at future SEM Investment and Finance Initiative webinars. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.